Tuesday, we talked about population ecology. When we're talking about population ecology, we mean members of the same species and what happens with their growth and how other factors, environmental resistance, can limit their biotic potential. Today, as part of environmental resistance, we're gonna get into community interactions. And community means all of the organisms that live in the same place and have relationships with one another and how they affect one another. One of the things that we know in biology, and we've discussed this before, is that living things cannot exist alone. You cannot survive unless you interact with other organisms. Your survival relies on especially photosynthesizers to bring in energy into the ecosystem, and then how you interact with others in terms of passing on energy or getting more energy, and then who affects you, and how bacteria, other parasites, uh, predators, and so we're gonna look at all of those issues today with community interactions. An ecosystem, an ecosystem is very fragile. As I mentioned, you rely on other organisms to survive. Biotic potential is limited by environmental resistance. The interaction, a lot of times, environmental resistance is caused by your interaction with other organisms. Remember, we talked about biotic, the living things, B-I-O, means life, and abiotic, the relationship between the two of them, is ecology. Abiotic means without A, without bio, life, so the non-living factors, like geological forces, temperature, water and wind, and then rocks. So all of those factors, we rely on them. And then also air in general, maybe this could also symbolize air, and how all living things rely on both them, especially if we're talking about photosynthesizers, they need sunshine, it's an abiotic factor, they need carbon dioxide, they need water. And using them and going through a series of complex metabolic interactions, they make food, which has energy and nutrients, and then the rest of the organisms rely on them, but also we have other interactions. Any disruption and any little step in this process, whether we're talking biotic or abiotic, can have an effect on an entire ecosystem. So for example, the increases in carbon dioxide are having big effects on changes in temperature around the globe. And that is going to have an effect also on the ability to photosynthesize, on temperatures. Temperatures get too hot, microorganisms that photosynthesize are at risk. Remember, we talked about diatoms or plankton in the ocean, the phytoplankton, that if they get too warm or too acidic due to climate change, that's 70% of our photosynthetic activity on the Earth. So we're going to definitely see disruptions there. Let's talk about other disruptions. This is a lionfish. Lionfish are now common in the Caribbean Ocean area. So just below Mexico, even up through Florida, we're seeing them, and in the Caribbean, Central, uh, Central America, and the top of South America. This fish is common to the Indo-Pacific, so on the other side of the world. And we have an explosion of them. Lionfish, some interesting things about them are that they have poisonous spines that have a neurotoxin in them makes them very difficult for predators to eat. So some predators can withstand both the spines and the toxin in the spines, but there's not that many. Because these are indigenous to the other side of the world, and we, and we'll talk about in a second why they've exploded, but the explosion of them, we don't have a lot of predators on this side of the world that have adaptations to be able to eat them. 
So if you don't have anybody to eat you, you're going to be able to explode in your numbers. We are starting to see some of the larger predators adapt to eating them. The other thing about them is they have a really big mouth. And one of their adaptations that they have is that they can suck really strongly in, like a vacuum cleaner. Because they can kind of swim around on the reef and everybody's like, oh, leave that thing alone because it's got those poisonous spines. What they do is they go around and they suck up individual uh, juveniles on the reef. If they're eating all the juveniles, that means that there's no next generation of fish around. So we're seeing a lag in the ability of some of the fish populations to reproduce. Not just fish, but invertebrates as well, and other organisms on the reef, that they're sucking up all of the juveniles, and then what happens? You don't have a next generation. So they have a lot of really good adaptations for survival, but that is not good for an area of the world where they don't belong. What we call this is we call this an invasive species. A species that does not live normally in an area, it has invaded that area. It does not have natural predators. So the rest of the, the rest of the ecosystem is like, well, I don't know what that is, and they kind of ignore it. And then it goes about its business destroying the ecosystem. We also may call them introduced species. They're introduced from another area of the world. Sometimes they're called exotic because they're kind of new and interesting to this area. <coughs> Humans are often responsible for the introduction, the induced, uh, sorry, introduced species that's invaded this area that's exotic. So a little bit about the lionfish. Um, sometimes, and let me just mention that sometimes invasive species or exotic species are accidentally introduced or intentionally introduced. So the lionfish, there's some hypotheses about how they got here. So um, one is that somebody who likes to keep aquarium, aquariums in their house, that they had a lionfish and that they um, didn't want it in their aquarium anymore so they dumped it into the ocean and then it caused this population growth. Okay, so the only way that that hypothesis might be legitimate is that if that lionfish were a female and she were pregnant and had tons of like eggs that she could spew onto the reef and then most of the offspring survived, but you know, you'd need a lot of that situation to happen. Uh, likely what happens is that the shipping of materials from that side of the world to our side of the world has caused it. A lot of things are shipped from the other side of the world in huge cargo ships. If you've ever seen them, if you've ever been to like a port on the ocean, you'll see like these ginormous cargo ships. They're like a block long and they have train cars on them. And the train cars look like little tiny, right? From where you're, you might see them like a half mile away. The train cars look about that big and there's tons of rows and rows and rows of them. And they transport things from this side of the world to that side of the world. <coughs> What often happens is that when those ships, and you'll see them stacked super high, that when they go from that side of the world to our side of the world, what keeps them afloat is that this part of the ship, while it's you know pretty heavy with all of this, it has to be level with the water. So if the ocean is like that, what they have to do inside is they have to keep what we call ballast water. And inside of the ballast, what they'll do is, depending on um, the ecosystem that they go through, is that sometimes the ballast water, they'll dump it out and sometimes they'll take some in. And depending on like the level, um, they, these ships often go through what are called locks. So that they go through an area, and let's say that the ocean is this high, but they wanna come into an area, they want that lower toward the land, 
and the water on the other side of this lock is this high, what happens is the ship comes into this lock and water fills, and so they open up this gate and the ship comes in and the water level's high, and then once the ship is in the lock, they close the gate, and then they pump out water back into the ocean, and they bring the ship down to this level so that when they open the lock on this side, it can be even. And so they go from like water levels like that often. When they do that, and they bring it down, what they have to do is they have to get rid of a bunch of water so that they can then be their ballast Let's say they only need to be this high once they get through the lock. So they've got to get rid of a lot of this ballast water. Ballast water is taken in from the environment that you start at or finish at. And so the ballast water can be carried from one area of the world and then let go in another area of the world. And when they take ballast water in, sometimes species get sucked into that ballast water. And so likely that's how they came to this side of the world. People in areas of the world, like where I travel to, Belize, uh, they're hunting them so that they will go and they will have contests in the country and they will spear them and have like, or they'll just have a constant like reminder, like we wanna get rid of them. Because if the lionfish are eating the diversity of like, let's say a coral reef area, where a lot of people come to vacation and they want to go snorkeling or scuba diving and they want to look at beautiful reefs, but they're destroying them. The local people want to get rid of this because they want to preserve the beauty of their coral reefs. So a lot of people are trying to get rid of them. The other thing that they're doing is that a lot of people are trying to train larger predators like moray eels, sharks, groupers to eat them. So they'll spear them and then they'll hold them in their face and be like, come on, try and eat this. And so they're trying to train the large predator population to eat them. One of the other things in terms of the economics is that they've turned this into like, let's hunt them, but their meat, the muscle of this animal, like when you eat salmon, for example, right? You eat that red, pinkish colored stuff. That's the muscle of the, the fish. The muscle of this fish is more white it's very light and flaky. Um, it doesn't have a ton of like flavor, so you can flavor it with various kinds of spices. And it's a really nice fish to eat. So that now they're starting to put them, and they're like, okay, let's go capture them, and let's put them on the menu. And so they're benefiting economically in that way from this. But really, the idea is they want to get rid of them completely. So you mean like the poison is just outside, not like in the meat? Right, it's not inside. Good, good question, yeah. The poison is only in these spines. So that's the other thing is handling them. Oftentimes they'll wear like chain mail gloves so that they don't get poked or they'll um, try and like cut all of the, one of the things that they'll do is they'll cut all of these spines away on the outside first and then they'll try and get the meat. Okay, so in our area, you'll start to notice that in wetland areas, we have purple loosestrife. It's very pretty. It has tall, it's a very tall green plant and has these purple whorls of flowers on the top. Yeah, so you may um, start seeing them soon. They'll start to flower. This plant was brought over from Europe a long time ago. Our wetlands are typically, if you think of like cattails, right? They're green with the little brown tips and there's other like uh, grasses that are green, some brown grasses. And so people are like, our wetlands just don't have pretty colors. So let's bring over this that lives in wetlands in Europe and make it prettier. I'm kind of, you know, like in terms of just aesthetics, people didn't realize back in the probably like 1920s, 30s, they were like, let's just make the landscape prettier. But what happened is, is when they introduced this exotic species, there were no predators, no bugs that were eating it. And oftentimes what happens with species in a community is that the reliance upon predators to prey is very critical because predators will keep prey from exploding in numbers. So insects, if you remember a little bit about fungi, 
that there are fungi like cordyceps, for example, that get inside of insects and the insects start to get eaten from the inside out by the fungus. And then eventually the fungus just kind of like releases more spores because it has this insect food and it'll spread those spores to other insects. That is the way those fungus are the predator, and I said predator, I shouldn't even say that, but they're the predator of insects around the world. There's a lot of species of fungus that are keeping insects from just going really crazy. So they keep them under control. So predators really, not only is just like they're getting energy and nutrients from their prey, but they're helping to keep the prey in a level amount so that not one species is overtaking the whole ecosystem. When you have something that's introduced, you don't have that predator to keep this from spreading. So this starts to grow and grow and grow because there's no predators there. And while it's really beautiful, what it does is when it grows out of control, it keeps growing and it's pushing out other species from growing. And after maybe like 10 years, what you see is fields of this purple loosestrife and nothing else. So they will take the biodiversity from being very diverse to very little. When you do that, everybody who relies on that biodiversity and all the different species to get a variety of food and nutrients, they start to decline too. And so you have this kind of chain effect that happens, is that when you start to have this biodiversity and this starts to kind of crush that and lower it, and if you're just talking about like the plant species, then what happens is the animal species, the fungus species, everything starts to decline. And you start to get a uniform of only one kind of species, and that's not good. Let's think about this idea. If I said to you, I want you to think about, is this, would you say yes to this? Eating oranges is healthy. If you eat an orange, you think like that's a healthy food. Let's say a nice organic orange, right? That's healthy. How about this? Eating only oranges is healthy. Okay, so that's the idea here, is that in an ecosystem, if you have oranges and apples and cucumbers, and like you have this variety of food, it's great. But now take that variety to only one species of food. That's not great. And that's what an invasive species does, is they cause only one thing to be around. This, pretty, right? Healthy for an ecosystem? No. Yeah, so that's kind of the idea here, is that when we're looking at invasive species, while they sometimes are like, like the lionfish is a beautiful, mind-boggling, beautiful fish. But when you have all lionfish, that's not good. And also all the different kinds of corals and other fish and invertebrates that are also beautiful and make for this nice variety on a reef when that goes away and you just have lionfish and like black rock because the corals are all dying, you're like, well, that's not really that pretty. So we have to be very careful as humans as what we introduce from other areas of the world. The University of Illinois, which I know a bunch of you will end up going to, they had done a study on this explosion of purple loosestrife and they found the predator, a little tiny beetle, that they began introducing to try and control this. So that beetle is from the other side of the world, too. So now, what happens when the beetles eat all of this, and then the beetles are still there? So then they have to introduce a predator to eat the beetle. And then that predator, you know, it's like, so we have to like think about that. And that's one of the parts of their study, is what do we do to like balance the introduction of a predator, but not allow that predator to also get out of control? So there's a lot of thought to this. What if that species causes us to have allergies or a nervous system reaction or causes us to have damage to our digestive system? We have seen that some introduced species have harmed human health. And as I mentioned with Belize, is that they're trying really hard to get rid of the lionfish because people come to see that 
biodiversity, the beautiful coral reefs, is that if they're left with lionfish and just dead rocks that corals used to grow on, people aren't going to come there anymore. So it can really harm the economy of an area if you have ecotourism, or if you're a farmer and you're growing food and this starts to take over. Well, that limits your ability to grow your food. So these species can have very dire effects on economy too. So here's a community. Sometimes it's like, oh, poor, poor zebra, right? The zebra's getting eaten by the lion, but then the lion's getting attacked by this eagle or, you know, so sometimes you think like, oh gosh, this is so sad, but that's, you know, like the circle of life is that some of these things happen, but they have to happen. We don't have to worry about it, right? You don't walk out the door and you're, uh, you're like, okay, I gotta get to my car before that bear and that lion and that tiger and that shark get me. I mean, that would be a great ad adaptation. All of these community interactions are just normal and they're important and necessary. So the interactions, good and bad, like we might think like, go community, we eat a variety of different kinds of energy sources, but also somebody's gotta eat those energy sources and somebody's gotta eat that energy source. And so the eating part of it, we get a little like, oh, that's so sad. But that's the way nature goes. The way that all these species interact shapes how healthy the community is or not. A lot of natural populations, if humans just left it all alone, there'd be a nice balance between all of these feeding systems and the growing systems. The problem is, is that humans disrupt these ecosystems in so many different ways. And so through habitat destruction or other parts of the world where they're hunting certain species to a point of extinction, like rhinoceros, people hunt them for their horn. Elephant tusks, people hunt them for their tusks and they're hunting them to extinction. So will humans be an invasive species? We are absolutely <laughs> the most invasive species. Yes, excellent point. We have invaded these ecosystems and hurt almost every ecosystem on the planet. Climate change in itself, climate change has affected every species on the earth. Every species. Who has caused an increase in climate change right now to points that we've never seen before? That would be us. Yes, so thank you. That was a great point. All right, so what has a natural, we're going to think a little more naturally. I know that humans, we look, kind of like lurk over all of this but we do have to teach about natural systems when we talk about ecology. And what happens with species is a process called co-evolution. Co-evolution means that one species acts as an agent of natural selection on another. So what does that really mean? It means that as one species changes or evolves, the genes or the traits that are favored must also be favored in that population, therefore they must evolve. So for example, this is a really great picture. Here you have a hummingbird, and this is the main species that it eats from. You can see that the bill is like a long needle so that this hummingbird can fit its bill into here and still keep flying, hovering in front of it. So the shape of the hummingbird fits precisely with the shape of its food. Now, let's say that it's not as rainy one year and the flowers only grow to here. That, that might affect its ability to eat from this or vice versa. Let's say it's super rainy because you have flooding and this grows to here. Now they can't get to the food that's down in this yellow area. If we have constant in an area, constant rains, and these start to grow really, really long, it doesn't mean that they're going to change, right? They can't just poof instantaneously be like, I'm going to grow a bigger bill. What's going to happen is that anybody in this population who has a really long bill, 
the females, remember the, the males have a really, really long bill and can do a better job of getting food, the females are gonna be like, that's sexy. Really, really long bill, it's sexy. So I'm gonna mate with them so that my offspring can also have a really, really long bill. And so when this changes, what's favored in the population that relies on them is going to be whatever matches up with what's changed here. And then it goes through this whole process of evolution where natural selection, those with the best traits are going to be favored. They're going to reproduce more, pass on those good traits to their offspring. So when we're talking about co-evolution, it's not something that takes place in like a matter of minutes or months. It will take years of change in these two populations over time. Remember, evolution takes a long time. It's not instantaneous, and you can't direct it. So they can't just grow along the bill. They can't will it to happen. There's this whole selection factor that's going to happen over time. sea turtle has a friendly face. But to a bottom-dwelling crustacean, it's the face of a ruthless hunter. Loggerheads weigh an average of 300 pounds and can weigh up to 1,200 pounds. They use their powerful jaws to crush and tear up prey which means this slipper lobster won't get much use out of its exoskeleton. Though this bottom-dwelling prey has one advantage, it doesn't have to take a breathing break. Still, the sea turtle makes short work of the slower creature. Loggerheads eat a huge variety of foods, both plants and animals, a veritable smorgasbord but nothing beats really fresh seafood. All right, so a little bit about this interaction here that you just saw. Let's go back 10,000 years. So we have sea turtles and we have slipper lobsters. And what's going on right now is that the slipper lobster, it doesn't have a hard outer coating. It, doesn't swim really fast, meaning that it doesn't have strong ab muscles. You saw it kind of like doing this motion. That means it's crunching its abs and it's scooting away so that it can fly away from the lobster, I mean from the, the sea turtle. The sea turtle, let's say that it doesn't swim very fast, and it doesn't have that hard mouth. So over time, if it has this gummy mouth like us, and it's, it can eat the slipper lobster, just grab some. Slipper lobster has a soft body. So the slipper lobster population are getting eaten and the females in the population are looking at the males and going, wait, there's that weird mutation. That one has like developed a hard outer coating. So I noticed that when the, the sea turtles try and eat those ones with that mutation, that they can't crunch through. So the females are like, I'm gonna mate with the ones with the hard outer body, the exoskeleton. So over time that's selected for and that becomes higher in the population because females are selecting those with that hard outer body. Sea turtle population, there's a mutation for this hard mouth, a beak. And so now the females are like, wait, I can see that those with that beak can crunch through that hard outer coating of the slipper lobster. So females are gonna start selecting the beak. And over time, that beak is gonna go up as a favored trait. Slipper lobsters have a mutation for having these strong abs so that when a sea turtle with the beak tries to eat through the hard outer coating, they can go and they can swim away. So now females are like, ooh, I like the ones with the hard outer coating and the strong ab muscles because they can get away from the sea turtles. Sea turtles 
just by chance, evolve a mutation where they give longer fins so they can like move a little bit faster, swim a little faster. So now females are like, I like the males with the hard beaks and the ability to swim faster. And so you see over time, what's favored changes to be an advantage in the population. That's co-evolution. So we see that throughout ecosystems over time. Sometimes with certain traits, like maybe a thousand, mil let's say a million years ago, that whales, it was favored to be smaller. But over time, it's been favored for them to get bigger. And you can see that happening, these changes in favored traits. If you remember the glyptodon, glyptodon looked kind of like an armadillo, but car sized, it was really big. Think about the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs are really big. That's not favored in a lot of animals now. It's favored to be smaller. So like reptiles, for example, birds, for example, went from being really, really big in dinosaur times millions of years ago, and now they're more favored to be smaller. And who knows, maybe over time they'll get bigger again. But it's just what is favored. So you can't go by which traits are favored, like big is better than small. It might be small is better than big. So some of the things in your mind, you just have to think like, what is favored in the current environment and why? And you'll see those traits rising in percentage in the population. Even horses with grass. That horses evolved over time, it was favored for them to have more molar or flattened wide teeth in their mouths so that they can crush apart the cellulose, which is strongly bonded. If you remember when I talked about cows, that cows eat a high amount of grass naturally, and that cellulose is hard to break apart. And so like cows, they have a lot more molars for crushing. They also have those bacteria in their stomach that produce cellulates to help break down the cellulose better. What could be favored if horses keep eating the grass Maybe the grass have a mutation for poison. And then poison is favored. And so we go back and forth. And then maybe what's favored in horses much later is that the ability to withstand that poison. So we can go back and forth over long periods of time. Community interactions are not just predator prey, but also competition amongst members of a species, parasites. And we'll talk about the kind of nicer things that species do for one another, mutualism. All right, so a little bit about competition. Competition, um, remember that competition is when members are trying to get a limited resource. And as a result of them both trying to get a limited resource, they are going to either work together so that they all have access to that limited resource, we talked about aggressive behaviors. That aggressive behaviors is just saying like, let's not fight, move away. Or have like hierarchies in a population. So everybody kind of gets access at different levels. That's one way to limit the awful effects of competition. When we're talking about competition between members of different species, that's called inter-specific competition, which happens all the time that you might have on the prairie, you might have a variety of different kinds of rodents, like 10 different rodents, like mice and rats and voles, they're out there and they're all competing for the same kinds of food. They eat very similar kinds of food. That's what we call inter-specific competition. Competition in general, generally harms everybody who's involved. But, like I said, there are ways to limit that harm Reducing one's access, excuse me, reducing one's access to a limited resource can hurt or maybe not. Maybe you can like just say, I'm gonna eat at this time of day and you eat at that time of day. Or um, I'll eat in this area, you eat in that area. So there's a lot of ways that you can share resources to limit the harm 
amongst members of either different species or even the same species. So let's talk a little bit about the ecological niche. When we're talking about a niche, it means all the aspects of an organism's life. Everything they do, everything they eat, everyone they interact with, every nutrient, everything that they need, that encompasses the niche. A lot of times people think that the niche is just the house. The home is called the habitat. So niche is like everything. Habitat is one part of the ecological niche. Other things that are included in the ecological niche besides your home or your habitat, all the resources you need, what do you eat, who eats you? What kind of other factors besides eating do you need? Maybe like things that you need to build your home. Maybe you need like mud and rocks and sticks and grass. Your environmental needs. What temperature do you live at? What time of day do you like to be active? What time of day do you like to rest? Where do you like to rest and why? Your behaviors, how you interact with others of your own species, how you interact with others of different species, how you interact with your predator, your own prey, how you interact, how do you compete with members of your species as well as other species? And what's your job? So an obvious job of plants is to photosynthesize. That's what they do for the entire ecosystem. Now remember that plants, the way that they survive is that one they grow like a tomato. Like, let's say that soon, after finals are over and you're de-stressed and you're like, this summer I'm gonna grow food and you plant your tomato plant. Your tomato plant is going to offer you tomatoes, but also it's gonna keep growing. So plants can grow and then offer food. And then you have those that'll take the food and the plant just keeps growing. The plant in providing not only food, it's providing the action of photosynthesis, which is taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So the plant is doing two things. It's offering food, but it's also offering the process of photosynthesis as well. Every organism has some kind of contribution that they make, whether obvious or not obvious to an ecosystem. Every species has a different ecological niche. Even if you are the same species, let's think about all of you, for example. Do you all live in the same habitat? No, you have different homes, right? So even that, there's ways for members of the same species to diversify their niche so that they don't compete for every single thing. The way that organisms prevent being excluded from an ecosystem, meaning that they're gone, they're not in the ecosystem anymore, is what's called the competitive exclusion principle. And actually I should say, this is, like, this is what happens when two species have such similar needs, is that one can be excluded because of competition, and we'll talk about ways to limit that in just a second. Okay, so the competitive exclusion principle says that when two species keep competing for the same limited resources, they're doing all the same niche things, is that the one who is better adapted or has the better characteristics or traits to take advantage of that same niche will outcompete the other one, and the other one will die off. So if you're just better at doing the same things as somebody else is doing, you're going to succeed, just like you all. If you're better at studying, you've got it down, you're disciplined, you know what to do, you're better at getting an A than someone who just doesn't have all of that together yet. Less adapted species die off. So here we have a situation where, let's say that in situation one, that you've got these birds, these yellow birds, and they like to take advantage of the top of the tree, the middle of the tree, and the grass underneath the tree. But now, these red birds are introduced. They come into that population. The red birds are bigger and stronger. 
So what can happen is the red birds could just be like, bye yellow birds, we're gonna eat all the bugs, we're gonna fight you, and we're gonna eat all the bugs and kill you off. But fighting, these red birds, if they have to constantly fight any yellow birds, is that going to harm them in some ways? Fighting in general, even if it's just like, you know, you're really big and strong and you're fighting something that is like maybe weaker but smarter, that weak but smart individual you're fighting can still hurt you. So fighting is not a good idea regardless. Fighting, you end up getting hurt in the process. So the red birds are like, well, I could do the competitive exclusion principle and I could outcompete them, but usually you're gonna get hurt in the process. So what they end up doing is that most species who are competing for the same resource will say, and I'm not really sure intellectually how they communicate this, but it works out that the red birds end up you know, communicating, we'll, we'll stick in the middle, the trunk, because we have bigger claws and we can hold on to the trunk of the tree and eat the bugs in the middle. And since you don't have as big as claws, you can hang out in the grass and you can hang out on the branches up here. So that's easier for you up here and here, and it's easier for us in here, and we can share this entire resource. So they do not, they work it out so they do not exclude each other. There was a study done on, excuse me, there was a study done on two different species of paramecium. So same kind of organism, but just a little bit different species, a little bit different genetics. And when they put them in their own flasks, like these own glass environments with food and space, they both grew, they showed that J-shaped curve, but then because there's only so much space in the flask, they leveled out at a carrying capacity. So both of them in their own flasks show an S-shaped curve. When they poured them into the same flask, what happened was there was great competition. And the one that was more adapted to that environment outcompeted the other. And over time, what they ended up with in the flask, instead of two that showed this, they had one that did this and crashed, and the other one over time, a longer time, showed a smaller S-shaped curve. So here's what the graph looked like in two different flasks. You have that nice S-shaped curve leveling out at the carrying capacity. And then when we put them in the same flask, the blue one was better adapted, showed this S-shaped curve, and the red one climbed up and then died off over time. So this shows the competitive exclusion principle. Natural selection favors organisms who do not have as much competition in their life. Meaning that, if you figure out a way for your life to be easier in relationship to everybody else around you, you're gonna have a better time surviving. It's kind of like living in a house. If you live in a house with a bunch of people and you're just like crabby all the time, which if you're crabby all the time, does that make everybody else around you crabby all the time? And it's just miserable for everybody? But if you realize and you're like, wait, if I'm less crabby, everybody else might be less crabby. And so you be, if you're going to be happier, kinder, more helpful than everybody else is like, oh, this is great. And everybody learns to coexist better. It's kind of like the idea of species in an ecosystem. If they're like doing something and they're getting competition and they pull back and they kind of like rethink, like how can I do this one thing of my niche so it doesn't hurt me anymore, and it doesn't hurt them anymore. Maybe I'll pull back, maybe I'll do something different. That if you just change a little bit, you lower your competition, you have a better chance of survival. So limiting your competition over time, changing the adaptations, or in a population, maybe looking at what's better favored, what traits do better. The females will be like, I'm gonna mate with males who do things a little bit easier and then those traits go up over time, that limits competition, fighting, that access to limited resources. So here's birds, these are called warblers. There's like 400 species of warblers in the world. They are migration birds. So they go from like one area of the world, they go fly all the way down and all the way back. And one of the things that warblers like is they like pine trees. 
So every time they go into an ecosystem, what they're looking for is they're like, where's the pine tree? So let's say that the bay breasted warbler, it gets there first on migration day to this particular tree. And the black guardian warbler comes and it's like, what if this one says, I'm gonna fight this off because I want this whole tree to myself. And then this one comes and this one comes in, and this one's like, I'm gonna fight all of you. Would it be better for that warbler to be like, all right, hey, oh, you came along? Okay, I'm gonna take this little area of the tree, but you can have that area. And then another one comes and they're like, you can have that area up top and we're gonna stay here. And then this one comes and these three are like, well, you can have this area right here. And then another one comes and they say, well, you can have this bottom area down here. What that does, them sharing a limited resource, right? This is the only tree in an area that they all come to because they're migrating and they're all like, oh, this is the only pine tree in this whole area. By sharing this limited resource here, they lessen competition, which means that they don't have to fight for the thing that they need right then and there. They all have been flying all day. They need to eat and they need to rest. So they negotiate sharing. What we call this is we call this resource partitioning. Resource partitioning is like sharing. It limits the fight over a limited resource. Resource partitioning typically happens between members of the same species, because they have the complete same niche, as well as members of species who are similar but not identical to them. Got a lot of sharing that has to go on, right? You live in a house with other people, you know you gotta share things. Sometimes you bring home something really good and you're like, oh, I'm gonna eat this whole thing myself. And the other person's like, can I, can I have some of that? And you might be like, oh, I want this for myself. But then you might think, well, if I share this, we're all gonna have a good night and maybe a good tomorrow. So sometimes sharing is worth pulling back on everything you have because it's going to help you sustain that relationship in the long term. So accessing or having a smaller niche than you normally would have helps survival for most species. You want to reduce the effects of inter-specific competition. Remember that inter-specific competition is competition between members of the of different species. We also have intra-specific competition, which is competition between members of the same species who have the same niche, but maybe a little bit different to allow for survival. So intra-specific competition is competition between members of the same species. And again, they can have the exact same niche, but do you live in the same house as everybody in here? Do you eat the same things as everybody in here? Do you drive the same car or have the same kind of transportation, right? So you've changed your niche a little bit to allow for better survival of you. You don't have to fight everybody in this room for every little thing. This especially, we talked about population ecology yesterday. This can help you to go from having an S-shaped curve over a J-shaped curve and a crash. So it can really affect the size and distribution of every species on the planet. All right, so back to interspecific competition because we're gonna talk a lot about the interaction today in communities, competition between members of different species. Community ecology is you, your species interacting with other species. So here you see that every species has a different place that they live or habitat, but then what they do in that habitat will vary. So even there, like these worms and these pill bugs and these fungi, they all do different things within this habitat here so that they can survive in the same place. So predator prey, we mentioned this before. Predation is the act of killing and eating another species. So 
So even if you are an herbivore and you only eat plants, are you killing plants to eat them? By definition, an herbivore who only eats plants is still a predator on those plants. So cows eating grass, cows are predators. Owls eating mice. Whales eating tiny little plankton. Doesn't seem very fierce, but you don't have to be a fierce predator to survive in an ecosystem. Bats eating insects. Sharks eating everybody. All right, so predators are generally larger, generally larger than their prey, or they might work as a group, a pack of wolves, and take down a big elk or a moose. So either you yourself are larger or collectively as a group you're larger. Typically, predators are less abundant than their prey. They've got to constantly have a lot of food around. So their prey will grow quicker, or have a shorter lifespan, life cycle, I mean, from being born until they can reproduce. So co-evolution, when we're talking about predation, we're talking about co-evolution. Prey have to do something to avoid predators. Predators have to do something to become better hunters of their prey. Predators have to be able to eat their prey. Maybe they have certain kinds of teeth, for example, a beak, claws. When you think back again with the sea turtle and the slipper lobster, over long periods of time, the pressure to favor different traits over time changes so that they both can survive over long periods of time. They exert natural selection on each other. They are agents of natural selection on one another. So, for example, maybe, maybe hawks didn't need very good eyesight because let's say that mice were white and they're in green and brown grasses, so the hawks would be like, oh, I see that white movement there. I know that's a mouse. There's a mutation where the mouse there's some mice who have a brown and beige coat. So the females are like, oh, that, that male can hide better from the hawks, so I'm gonna mate with them. And the hawks, being able to spot this movement, this very subtle movement, where they can blend in easily is going to be important. So over time, good eyesight in hawks is favored. There are anti-predator defensive or what we call counteracting behaviors. So that favoring of the more brown and beige color in the mice is a counteracting behavior to the hawks eating them. Counteracting behaviors can be your physical, how you look, could be your internal physiology, you're poisonous, could be that you just, a hawk comes around, you have the good coloring, and you're like, I'm gonna hold still. So if I hold still, they won't see the movement and they won't be able to spot me. So it could be your behavior. Bats and moths. Bats use sonar to detect their food. If you ever heard that phrase, blind as a bat, there are, in, in most bat populations, because they hunt at night, they either have very weak eyesight or some of them are actually blind. And so they use sound waves, sonar, <laughs> right? They don't, you don't hear that, but there are these sound waves that they can emit. And it hits something, and when it bounces back, it gives them in their mind a picture. So when they send out these sound waves and they get the shape of a moth, they're like, ooh, there's a moth there, and they fly toward it. Moths have very simple hearing. So moths will be like, I hear that, that little sound wave, I'm gonna hide, because there's a bat around. 
So they can change the way they fly. Bats realize, or well, I shouldn't say bats. What's favored is a bat that can send out a different wavelength of sound so that the moths can't hear it. So the moths can hear one kind of sound wave, but now you have a mutation for bats that have a different sound wave, and those with a different sound wave, they can target the moths because the moths can't hear that one. So what moths do over time is moths are just like, oh, if I click, it's gonna disrupt that sound wave so that the bats, when it flies back from that set back to the bats, there it's like messy and the bats can't interpret what they sent out. So then the, the bats are like, well, the moths are clicking, so maybe I just stop. I'll send out some sonar, I'll wait, I hear they're clicking, now I'm gonna stop sending out sonar, I'm just gonna fly toward the clicking. So you can see that back and forth, that counteracting behavior, coevolution. They're both changing the way they interact. One of the other things that is a counteracting behavior is camouflage. Camouflage means that you blend in. It makes you inconspicuous or blend into your environment. So you could be, like if I had an outfit that was like white and blue, it might be harder for you to focus on me. But with this outfit, I'm not blending in, right? So I could camouflage myself and be present and you might just like overlook me. Which behavioral response to the threat of predation is most likely selected for in a species that uses camouflage for protection from predators? and you're still like, right? You're, this movement is going to attract the predator to you. Here's a few examples of camouflage. This is a flatfish. They have skin pigments that can change based on their environment. So the, the mouth is here. This is the head. But they blend in pretty good. So I mean, I, you could probably make it out. But if you're just like swimming over and you're 20 feet up, you might not recognize a fish is here. Some frogs have coloration to blend in with mud. And then you have the Arctic fox, who for the majority of the year, when it's snowing, they're white. In areas where climate change is affecting their habitat, this coloration is becoming more favored, kind of more like white and gray with a stripe down the middle to break up the body shape so that they can hide inside branches and bushes. This is an experiment they did that a scientist did with flatfish. Is they took a flatfish and they put it in different environments. And for example, the flatfish has never seen a checkerboard. They put it in there. And it's not perfect, but is that pretty impressive for an animal that has never seen this coloring environment and pattern? Pretty intelligent. Predator camouflage is important too. So snakes, for example, the reason why snakes have stripes and triangles and are, a lot of snakes are colored brown so they can blend in with leaves and grass that's dead and mud. So even predators, camouflage is important for it. For example, this cheetah. The cheetah has coloration of the same color of grasses Spots and stripes help to break up a body pattern, so it's actually harder to see from afar. Cheetahs, snakes, what they will do is in their habitat, they use their camouflage to blend in. As we said before, being able to hold still is really important. So like a cheetah is gonna hunch down in the grass, and it's gonna hold still, and a little gazelle comes bouncing by, and they can jump out and grab it. This is a frogfish. This is the eyes, the mouth. 
these colorations make it look like it has holes like a sponge, so that it looks like a sponge on a reef. There's so many things that are cool about this. One is, is that they have a fishing lure. They actually have a little lure on a pole that they can either put out there or retract back to their head. And on the end, they have a little thing that they can hold still. And then they can put their lure out, they put their fishing pole out, and they shake their lure a little bit. So something can come over and investigate that. And when a fish comes to investigate that, they can jump out and get them. The other thing about this group of animals is that they have a giant mouth, so they can eat things pretty big, but they can also consume something a third of their body size in one bite. So let's say that you weigh 150 pounds. Could you imagine eating 50 pounds of food at a time and in one bite? This is called episiomatic coloration, warning coloration. Being brightly colored just says, I'm poisonous. So if you are this frog, you can just hop around in the rainforest all day and be like, ha, ha, nobody's gonna eat me, I'm poisonous. Same with this snake. So these colors, episiomatic coloration says, don't eat me, I'm poisonous. You'll suffer if you eat me, so leave me alone. It almost seems counterintuitive, right? That you're like advertising them here. Mimicry. Mimicry means that you have evolved the benefit to look like something else. Sorry, I didn't know you all made this poisonous thing. You missed it. So you've evolved to look like something else. It could be as benign as being like, you are a cactus and you're brownish, grayish, like rocks around you. And so you're a cactus and you're like, I'm just gonna grow here. No one's gonna notice I'm here, nobody will eat me. We'll get into more advanced issues. Okay, so here you see the cactus with the rocks around it. The shape and coloration match up pretty well. These little spikes on this tree some of them are the spines of the tree, and some of them are Florida tree hopper insects. So some of the insects have evolved the shape to match the spines on the tree. So that if, if a species comes over and they're like, I'm gonna eat this thing, some of them are spikes on the tree and they'll pierce their head. And some of them are little insects. So those insects could just be like, I'm gonna hang out by these uh, spines, I'm gonna blend in, nobody's gonna eat me. Batesian warning mimicry. These are species who are not poisonous, but have evolved to look like something poisonous. So they benefit from looking like another species who is poisonous. So we've got two examples here. So remember the coral snake, the coloration I pointed out was poisonous. Here you have a mountain king snake who looks similar enough. I mean, you could probably memorize that, you know, the coral snake has larger black areas and smaller on the mountain king snake. But if you're, let's say you're out walking around and you come across one of these two, are you gonna go like, wait, let me think for a second, which one, right? You're just gonna be like, ah, oh, they're bright and black and yellow is bad. Run away and you're gonna run away. This is in our area. This is a monarch butterfly. Monarch butterfly, they eat milkweed. You might see soon uh, the caterpillars are really pretty, that they grow on milkweed. Milkweed's called milkweed because if you break the plant, like even a leaf, it releases this milky substance and it's poisonous. They have about the ability to consume that poison and incorporate it into their body so that as butterflies, they are poisonous. Uh, we are seeing some birds adapt to dealing with that poison, and some birds are now eating them. The spotting on this butterfly, as well as it not having the stripe, is similar enough. 
to the viceroy butterfly, who looks very similar to the monarch, but has the spots right at the edge here and then that line right there. So birds will avoid both of these. And then there's malarian mimicry. So as I mentioned before, this is the advertisement. I am poisonous. Look at my pretty colors. You can't eat me, you'll die. Sometimes it's an advertisement of not poison, but I taste really bad. If you eat me, you're not gonna like what you, you eat here. It's gonna taste bad. So that's malaria mimicry. Aggressive mimicry is the example that I give you of the frogfish. Is that the frogfish has a lot of adaptations, it blends in, it sits still, it's got the fishing lure, and it can eat whole things at once. This is pretty aggressive mimicry. Just like the anglerfish, it's a relative of the frogfish. They can turn on a light here deep in the ocean, and then when something comes to investigate the light, they eat them. Advanced mimicry is when you look similar enough, and you can do some behaviors that are really similar to something else, and you can benefit. So these jumping spiders, they do a dance when they're about to tap, attack or fight something. So they'll get down and they'll just go like, and then they're going to jump and attack. The snowberry fly has coloration on its wings that when they turn around and they show their wings, it looks like the legs of the spider. So from a little bit far away, they can go and they can do that similar dance and whatever is back there is like, ooh, there's a jumping spider, I'm gonna stay away. Startle coloration is when you have eye spots. It looks like you have big eyes. So if you're a bird flying over this moth or this butterfly larva, you look down and you're like, ooh, there's something with big eyes down there. I'm not gonna fight them. But really, it's just this eye spot coloration. Eye spots are also in areas that even if something comes and they're like, I'm gonna bite this head of this large thing, this area, which would be the head of something larger, it's the back wings. So like it will hurt that species or this, this individual. But if this gets bitten, it really flies away with these. So eye spots are often in places that are less important. This is the tail. So the larva has actual like the ability to, to make a light on the other end where it's major parts of its nervous system are. This is just the tail. So if their tail gets bit, they can survive that. You might use chemicals. So venom and snakes. We saw the bombardier beetle can shoot out, it has a chemical reaction, remember, in the bottom of its tail, where it can shoot out boiling liquid onto whatever's bothering it. Octopi, octopuses, use ink. They can shoot ink out, and ink's not poisonous, but it makes like a cloud in the water, so that whatever's trying to attack them can't really see, and so they can scoot away. So here you can see those ink clouds that they use. Plants even have strategies, as I mentioned before, that plants have adaptations like poison or having a lot of fiber makes it hard to eat for most species. Cows have evolved so many strategies for eating grass, like having that huge stomach system with bacteria that have cellulase, enzyme to break down the fiber or cellulose, and then also like burping up their food to rechew it and having a lot of molars. So a lot of things to eat food. As I mentioned the milkweed before, that the monarch caterpillar eats poison and incorporates poison into its body, but it can withstand that poison. Cacti use spines. You try and bite me, it's gonna hurt. All right, last little bit. Symbiosis means you 
live together in the same environment. Sameness is often thought of as a good thing, but it also can be a harmful thing. So we're going to look at a couple of different ideas of symbiosis. Symbiosis, symbiosis includes parasitism and mutualism. Parasitism, I mentioned last lecture, you live in and on a host and you want to feed off of them, but you also don't want to kill them because you want to live off of them for a long time. Mutualism, both species benefit in this interaction. Sometimes commensalism is also included, and it seems like in textbooks it goes back and forth. Um, the idea of commensalism is similar to mutualism, where there's an interaction, and one species benefits and the other species isn't harmed or doesn't benefit. But a lot of ecologists don't believe that you would have an interaction between two species where they both don't either benefit or one isn't harmed and the other benefits. So it's kind of like maybe something in between here, but a lot of times it's not included. All right, so parasitism, you live in and on your host. You feed off your host, weaken your host, but you don't kill your host. As I mentioned, some of you may be parasites to your family. Try and, try and behave enough so that they'll keep giving you a house and a car and a cell phone and food. All right, don't go ahead and kill your parents. Some examples, bacteria, viruses, or parasites. This is a lamprey eel. It can be like suction onto a fish, an alligator, eat off of it for a while. Or we might be familiar with leeches. We want to get them off because they might cause an infection, but they can live for a long time. Mutualism is when both species benefit in this relationship. Usually what's involved is food, housing, and protection. They may offer all of those things to each other. What this means is really like they're kind of using their niche to give to the other individual's niche and vice versa. So they're like sharing their niches completely and it benefits them both. The classic example of this is the anemone, anemone and the clownfish, is the anemone is going to fight any predators. It's going to get bigger pieces of food and give that to its anemone, so fight off predators, give food to its anemone. Sorry. Um, it will live in its anemone. The anemone gives the clownfish a home. Anemone also can get food and give some to its clownfish. So they're sharing all of their niches together so that they can both survive. That's mutualism. Sometimes you can have a species that mimics something else for its survival. So we kind of talked about that before. And then the last thing I will mention is the keystone species. These are certain species that pretty much everybody relies on in that ecosystem. So elephants are a keystone species because they will take down <coughs> newly formed trees, like saplings, so that more species of like grasses and other small plants can grow. So they have some, they allow some big trees to exist, but then they limit the amount of trees so that there's more diversity of plants. In this example, there was an ecologist who said, I'm gonna get rid of all these, these sea stars on the west coast. And when they got rid of the sea stars, all the food that the sea stars had, they ate everything. And then everything that ate that food was gone and it had this huge chain effect. When they put them back, the ecosystem went back into balance. 